Hello and welcome to the FMCC webinar, Owen Operations and Maintenance and the Health and Safety Collaboration in the 21st Century. And the presenter today is um, David Reynolds with FMCC. Next slide, please. Up just a second. <laughs> cool slide. There we go. There we go. And this is the FMCC's vision and mission statement. I do want to let everybody know that they are muted for audio quality. If you do have any questions at all during this webinar, please feel free and type them into the question box, and we'll review them at the end during the Q&A portion of this webinar. Also, a recorded copy will be placed on the FMCC website, fmcc.fml.org. Also, if you would like a PDF of the PowerPoint, you can go ahead and download that now. On your control panel, go down to Handouts, expand that box, and you can download that. The FMCC provides many services to the FM community, such as Ask the Expert, Find a Consultant, Locate a Speaker, and Online Educational Resources. You can find more information on their website, fmcc.ifma.org. Next slide. And I want to go ahead and thank our sponsors for today. And the, of the FMCC and also our, one of our newest sponsors, GFMA. Next slide. And the reason we are here today bringing these programming to you is for World FM Day, which we are actually making World FM Week. Next slide, please. I just want to thank you so we can bring attention to FM around the world. And in honor of this, the FMCC has put together over 30 sessions over a four-day span. Uh, we are calling it a virtual conference, and I would encourage you to attend as many sessions as you can. Next slide, please. And this next slide is just a screenshot of just some of the speakers that we will be hosting over the course of the next few days. Next slide. And at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our presenter, David Reynolds. David, the floor is yours. Joshua, thank you. Uh, sorry about the inept slide changes there. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm getting better at it. Okay, I uh, my background is life and environmental sciences, um, along with healthcare, aviation, and a mix of other things. So I'm not quite as young as I used to be. I uh, came to FM and IFMA about 15 years ago, FMP in 2005, and a CFM after that. And I am active, uh, along with Joshua and some of the other presenters today, in the FMCC STAG, the um, the action group, uh, where I'm co-chair, and also um, Operations and Maintenance Health and Safety Community. I'm also in the action group there. And that's what led to the presentation tonight. Um, my practice as an FM consultant, uh, FM strategy, quality, performance, those kinds of those kinds of strategic things. Uh, I'm balanced scorecard, uh, KPI certified, because I like to measure things because I'm an engineer and I haven't recovered. Uh, I'm certified in Stacey Barr's uh, performance measurement method, it's practical, basic. Uh, I'm trained in cause mapping, risk and decision tool licensed, uh, again, the, the engineer that won't leave. Uh, but my focal interest is also in the FM roles in organization, safety, readiness, and recovery. And in that regard, I'd like to find out a little about you. Um, I've got a poll here coming up. Uh, it'll, uh, Joshua will launch it in just a second. And for yourself, uh, either in your employment or your professional practice, I'm interested in whether facilities you met, whether environmental health and safety, EHS, is within facility management, that is to say a department or division, or whether they're separate, but they collaborate officially. They plan together, figure their work out together, or they're separate organizations and they cooperate on a case-by-case -case basis, or they're separate and they communicate only formally or uh, you know, officially. Good. Well, if you'd launch the poll, Joshua, thank you. Probably pretty good. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's good. There we go. Give me one second. And it looks like they say 
Interesting. FM and environmental health and safety are separate. Communicate uh -huh. only to I and inform. Yeah, um, and that does seem, thanks a lot, uh, that does seem to be the pattern, although a little bit more so even than I've seen it previously, oh, we got a small group. Um, well, that being the case, uh, let's see, I need to, hold on, I haven't been able to advance the slide, let me see, Put I know why, there the we go, <laughs> gotcha, right. Well, in that case, collaboration's on the move. Um, sorry that the slide of the picture is all guys, but uh, it was the theme was just too good to uh, to, to drop, um, because collaboration will be our touch point tonight. So, operations, op, whoops, I'm sorry. Operations and maintenance, health, safety, and environment. I'll use O and M for operations and maintenance, which of course is one of our FM themes. Of, principal activities, actually. And uh, for health, safety, and environment, I'll just use H&S, or sometimes I'll say EHS. Um, raise your hand on the little board if that gets too annoying and or if I, <laughs> if I misrepresent. So here we go. I have some propositions. Uh, the, my first proposition for collaborating is that well-being of the job, that is how well our organization does, how well we do, and on the job are inherent in one another. Seems obvious, but you know, you, you wouldn't know it sometimes given the way we all get separated. Second, that collaboration harms neither O&M or H&S and that it enhances both, proposition two. Proposition three, that in the 24th century, our business approaches and systems support collaboration. We have technology, we have the philosophies, management is management is all the time interested in consolidating and leaning. And we, frankly, are all interested in knowing because uh, knowing our business, understanding what we do, even if our skills are narrow, we want to understand broadly so we can perform well. And collaborations foster innovations. That is to say, working with others in closely related situations really brings out the knowledge of both and that the organization goals benefit. If you look at that snarl of highways on the right side of the slide, um, production benefits. We're at the production underpass looking at finance, another suitable goal for organization. Safety and environment are both important goals. And finally, compliance and our reputation. So we're serving the organization with successful collaboration, if we can get some. So those are my propositions to you. And our learning objectives then are to sketch the background that influences whether O&M and H&S uh, can join or can separate. We'll look at the, we'll look at the history of that um, that's brought us to where we are now. We'll explore six initiatives by people who are actually of uh, laying bricks in this wall, as it were, people who are doing practical things now, mixing O&M and H&S um, in facilities roles uh, and having them evolve together. And uh, finally, we'll point out some promising FM areas uh, for collaboration where the OMDS community uh, is interested in hearing from you, in getting some quick wins. So those are our learning objectives and a little bit of my background, uh, just so you can see where I'm coming from, because I come from both sides. Um, when, I, when I was young, uh, when early on I worked, I, I saw milled, I did construction, I was a city firefighter, put myself through undergraduate school that day. I, there's a picture there, the bottom sketch of demolition I deconstructed actually and tried to do a neat job of it but in all those cases you learn safety and production from the people you work for from the more senior people some of them are missing a few fingers and this and that and so they have authenticity but it's mainly a cooperative relationship and I moved on from there to more institutional situations I flew for the military um, in fact, not that very aircraft, but some that came out of the same assembly line. That's a U.S. Coast Guard helicopter. I worked offshore in production consulting, actually, in, in engineering and what was not quite the Internet of Things there, but uh, coming along that way, and uh, in power uh, transmission, which is somewhat the same. And our themes there were compliance was a central gospel for us. 
uh, we had institutionalized what we did for safety, uh, and we it became sort of rule of law with us. Very good that it did, because it kept us alive and our colleagues alive and safe. But it also had a way of of maybe pushing aside cooperation in some cases. Uh, and finally, of course, on the right, here we are in the 21st century FM. I'm the presenter, and I'm pushing collaboration. So and I hope you are, too, uh, for the advantages of ourselves, our colleagues, and our organizations. Um, a little bit on how safety people think. Uh, safety is, is thought of as a system. And we're going, we're going to go back now to about the 1930s when it first became necessary to think of safety as a system. Um, from there, the pieces of safety as a system, uh, the way the way people think about it, uh, is first of all policy, which has to come from leadership, of course. Um, second, um, uh, risk management, meaning verifying risks, learning about them, knowing what they are, and being able to deal with them, and being able to deal with them is called assurance. And that gets us to the photograph on the left. That photo is a checklist, pre-start, pre-engine start checklist, or pre-taxi, excuse me, checklist from, from a 1948 aircraft involved in the Berlin airlift. Uh, quite an act of, uh, of logistics on the part of cooperating countries moving enough food and supplies and so on into Berlin uh, when the um, what was then Soviet Union uh, put up the Berlin Wall and cut off land transportation. Um, what's what's it, What struck me about the checklist, and by the way, the photograph is mine. Sorry about the shadow. What struck me is the date. Uh, it was August 17th, 1948, which is to say there might have been another one the previous week. And so the pilots would regularly be receiving something new as experience on the risk management side showed what made sense to do, and that's assurance. So the pilots received the assurance that what they had was actually valuable and valid and worth doing. Finally, promotion. Uh, all, of the, all of the safety thinking in the world doesn't help us if we don't get the word out. And there on the, uh, on the right is a poster. I guess it's Danish, isn't it? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but this, this dates back, again, to about the same period of time, uh, which makes the point rather emphatically about the danger of electricity uh, to people getting involved in it. And despite that, uh, and, uh, and all the years in between, about a week before I gave the presentation, uh, Durability and Design, I believe it was, one of the trade magazines, had a story of a painter uh, painting a fire station, actually, in Salem, Massachusetts, in the U.S., who, in a bucket, who got involved into the wires and who died there uh, at a firehouse of all places. So the, the necessity of promotion goes on and on. But also that mindset of policy, risk management, assurance, and promotion that's what safety folks have. So we need to be working with that as FMs or marry it as much as we can to the way we think. So let's go take a look at, <laughs> let's go take a look at, I wish I had six or five, of the experiences of six people who are actually doing this in one fashion or another. They're, they're not all FMs, but they're right around the facilities industry. And I'm gonna first take you, for those in the United States, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, uh, is not always charitably looked upon. It's not always good in the minds of people who've worked with them. And yet, the entire time that OSHA has existed since the 1970s, they have had uh, a division, if you will, of professionals who visit on site and who work with clients in the commercial sector, the public sector, and then the um, institutional sector 
to make things work well and in safety and marry those with production. So this is this has been going on a long time, and we're looking at 40 plus years now. And uh, William Weems, Dr. Bill Weems, uh, professor at the University of Alabama, is director emeritus of the of the UA Safe State. Emeritus means, oh, you're retired, you lay back, and you do something once in a while. No, not Dr. Weems. <laughs> He's used that status to get out of the office and back into plants all the more. He's kept data for about 20 plus years. His viewpoint that he carries with him, and he says it when you start to talk and when you finish, is basically three things. For anyone working uh, in production or anyone working in a work situation, I have a right to safety, but I have a responsibility for my own safety. So the right and the responsibility are paired. And finally, I have a duty to others for their safety. So it's a nicely balanced um, mantra that Bill carries with him. And through the years, he's been, he's kept, as I say, kept data and been able to research on the database, both he and others in, throughout the United States, there are a total of 50 safe state uh, um, entities, Alabama, where, where Dr. Weems works is one of them. Um, one that really caught my ear is that the O&M predictors, that is, if you when you hear this from O&M, the predictors of good health and safety are the presence of a production supervisor who's also trained as a safety supervisor. That is, this is someone whose primary duty, whose main life is production, but who's trained uh, not only in safety as a subject, but in administering safety and making it happen. The second was the level of planned maintenance. That is, the amount of our maintenance which we're doing uh, scheduling as opposed to unscheduled uh, fix it now type of maintenance. And the third one is housekeeping. Made my little heart go pitter patter. <laughs> I am very much a proponent of keeping things clean in the workplace. And in a few minutes you'll see uh, one of my clients, a couple of my clients actually, and why that is true. Um, Dr. Weems' parting thought was that safety and health is a system. It's a system of subsystems. And of course, this follows my talk a few minutes ago about systems. And these systems work with operations and maintenance. So we manage them jointly. Uh, Andrew Young is the president of and chief designer because he's, just as I can't get rid of the engineer and me, uh, Andy can't get rid of the, the creative designer of glass in himself. And so he handles marketing and sales as president of Pearl River Glass, and he does a fair amount of the creativity. Look at the, look at the photo on the right. This is the Mississippi State Capitol Dome. Mississippi uh, is, a, in the United States, uh, one of 50 entities, governmental entities, that cover a fairly large area, and each one of them has a seat of government. This is the seat of government for Mississippi, only it's hardly a seat. Um, the person on the left, who I know personally, is up a pretty good ways. Pro River Glass had plenty of challenges in health and safety. And we worked with those over a period of several years. Uh, as I was doing a, a large construction management job for them, actually, we integrated HS into that. And they became a OSHA safe state uh, company was with, of course, Mississippi State State in this case, but they went through the whole program. It changed them a lot. Uh, uh, Andy's, the indications coming from Andy, and I, again, these interviews, uh, these were lengthy interviews, and I've just condens condensed them a great deal. Uh, I had the pleasure of having lunch with Andy. And the business case is what caused him to direct the shop and field operations to blend practices to make OMHS a reality and to acquire knowledge. And his whole staff now, there are about 24, are definitely dedicated in that way. Uh, his thoughts, um, and I, you know, I'm proud of them. We were several years together and his, he now sees, thinks, talks, and lives safety. Involve everyone. 
and see health and safety wherever you go. The day we met together, he had passed a construction site and noticed a, um, a rail, a temporary restrainer up uh, at the top of a roof. And he said, you know, I'm glad it was there, but it wasn't really big enough or strong enough. Finally, he said, solve problems, don't repeat. And from a small businessman, that is exactly what has to be done. Stephen Brown is a colleague in IFMA. He is my colleague in GFMA. He is a facility manager of decades of experience. And the slide I put up to indicate, to kind of suggest the situation between managing, between environment, health, and safety, and FM, that is between O&M, excuse me, between H&S and O&M. This is a crack where the Atlantic Ocean is gradually opening up in Iceland. And the gap is big. And so Stephen's situation uh, in managing a large project in the Middle East, a large multi-year project in the Middle East, was that a prolonged project needed involvement from environment, health, and safety, that is H&S uh, involvement, but not immediately. You can't do it all overnight. But the more that the FM mission became complex, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, the more, the more complex the FM mission came, the more that health and safety became essential to him. So what he did was to establish a reputation, a personal reputation of high integrity, communication, and always always saying the truth, and always saying it in an interactive way, in a cooperative way. He furnished his staff and the providers to the project with the knowledge, skills, and strong protocols to follow. So they felt part of what's going on, and they saw the roles that each contributed. Um, his thoughts, unrelenting two-way communication, build trust so that people expand awareness and willing to engage, because if not, we're not going to get across the divide. My next interview, uh, and again, these are people I know, uh, I know their practice fairly well. Uh, so it's not just a, a quick hit on the interview. Matt Town uh, began his career as a nurse, and he now works as a consultant for safety systems. He's located in the Northeast of the United States, um, and he works with heavy, heavy industry and construction. So he works with, with the tough guys. He works with people who are traditionalists about I tell them what to do, they do it, and we're all missing a few fingers, big deal, we're tough. Um, Matt w has been able to obtain a large degree of cooperation and turnaround in terms of number of lost time injuries, a cost of injuries, et cetera. And he's done that by making the business case to his clients, the executive suite. And then if it's clear that he has a champion there, then working with the crews themselves uh, out on the job. He, his, his principal observations really are two. One is that, that narrow, by narrow he means too restricted a job two restricted duties, a sense of this is mine, I do this, you don't do this, this is mine, this is all I do, I don't do yours. That hasn't worked out well for safety. Uh, it works against trust. It works against collaboration. Uh, an example he gives is of uh, a machinery repair man or repair person in a factory situation. I have a tool bag. My tools are for this machine. I repair that machine. He goes out to repair the machine, crawls underneath it. The machine is stopped. The machine operator goes away because nothing's going to happen. His legs are sticking out in the uh, right of the way of people walking. Occasionally, there's trip ups. He learns nothing. The operator learns nothing, and maybe someone's injured. The alternative uh, is that the operator stays. They talk. Uh, the operator learns a bit more about the operation of the machine. The person doing the repair is better protected, and the two of them are noticed collaborating. And once the culture is ready for this, uh, as it is in, in the case of Matt's clients, because he makes sure it is, um, then that brings us forward. That brings us into collaboration. So his thoughts are going the opposite of the narrow. Widen the mission. 
change the reward system. It doesn't have to be big rewards, but change the recognition system and to evolve what, what Matt calls a just culture, that is a fair, trusting culture. He closed with saying, you know, when no one mentions safety anymore, we've done it. Because safety has become a part of their work, uh, it's a part of the way they live, a part of the way they do. Uh, Peter Ludwig, uh, his title is as energy manager, he's working on retrofits of aged and somewhat uh, decrepit, we say, uh, in bad condition uh, re um, residential buildings, multifamily residents, uh, as many as 30 or more apartments in parts of Chicago that are in economic need. and. His staff, it's again about 25 people, uh, have to go out uh, and survey, make estimates, decide on work to be done. They're in buildings, sometimes inhabited, sometimes not, always with dangerous conditions. And it became obvious to Peter that neither being too narrow and being too specialized, uh, nor failing to communicate would get him anywhere. So his his scope is almost as a um, as an owner rep or an owner or a general contractor sometimes. And while energy is the central focus of the work they do, they actually end up doing a lot of other maintenance work because, of course, energy doesn't work unless other things happen in a building. Um, so he found that anyone, both his staff and others who visited, and he has about 15 people in the field most days, can encounter a variety of hazards. And so formal training uh, in the hazards and talking through the hazards is important to his staff. They meet about once a week or more and talk about the worst things they've seen. They do it in, in humor to some extent, but also it's a way of constantly staying aware. So be healthy, notice things. Think of your, when you are down in that boiler room, remind you that there's a life outside and that you need to conserve your energy and yourself and your well-being for that and do a complete job for each and every person who's going to work in there and live in there. So Peter's widening awareness and knowledge are essential to prioritizing work, to plan and to do the work. Another interesting thing that he pointed out is that the non-regulatory role of, of his NGO turns out to be quite helpful. People will talk. Uh, they're not OSHA. And uh, they're not, of course, they're not Dr. Weems OSHA, but they're not regulatory OSHA. And this has really helped a lot. Uh, he finds that he his people can build relationships with contractors, with residents, and do their share of training. In a few moments, um, the overall impact of that will come up in a later interview. Uh, so that's Peter Ludwig. Um, Jonathan Cohen, and this is the interview where that, uh, where what Peter observed emerges as an important value. Jonathan uh, is a department, of, as an employee, excuse me, of the United States Department of Energy, and he manages something which he actually developed called the Better Buildings Residential Network uh, that's part of the energy and efficiency, renewable energy uh, in Department of Energy. A lot of energies, huh? But he, um, the reason that Jonathan took the initiative to do this is because he was finding in reviewing the outcomes from energy projects that something else seemed to be going on too. People were healthier, and there was there was firm evidence for that. Their doctor visits, hospital visits, visits by uh, com by community nurses were fewer. And he wondered if this was actually happening, or it was just something hopeful that he was thinking. So he he and his colleagues began to acquire data, review papers, and establish a firm scientific basis for what they were doing. And sure enough, uh, it's it's supported. It's not true everywhere, and it's not true in every in every project. And so that brought on the next uh, the next question was how come it works someplace and doesn't work others? And by the way, the projects reviewed 
were in Europe, uh, South America, South of Central America, I believe, and in North America. So we had a pretty good sample, and they spanned, uh, I believe, about 10 years. So what the heck was going on? The good news is some of them worked, and there were enough of them to, to affirm why, but there were some that didn't. It turned out, when they looked closer, that when they trained building staff, it was worth training in depth, not to an engineering level, but to a level where a person taking care of a cleanup and ordinary maintenance of the building also knew how the HVAC in that building worked. Uh, because when a person knew that, they were more willing to communicate it and more interested in communicating it with the residents and more interested in learning more about it. The other thing, and this supplements the first, was that automation was a large success factor. That is the extent to which, and again, I'll use HVAC, but uh, security systems might be another good example. As we know from our buildings, there are plenty of possibilities here, especially in the age of IoT, that automation was a large success factor. That is, automatic control of control of sens sensory and control automated in some ways freed up the knowledgeable person on site, resident, uh, maintenance person, etc., to communicate more and to really look into things more. So these things are synergistic. Uh, Jonathan's thoughts that beginning with operations and maintenance training and quality, you get building performance. And if you get building performance, you get communication. And if you get communication, you get health and safety outcomes. Uh, now we'll generalize a bit with the areas where the OMHS community sees possibilities for, uh, for some quick wins. Uh, we're actually, uh, we've actually published in this area. We put out, we put out a query and a place to collect thoughts, and I will furnish that to you. You'll see my email in a few moments. But this is, these are the areas that the um, OMHS community sees as strong possibilities. Uh, asset management, that is to say, anything that we FMs take care of, uh, property assets, equipment assets. Um, there are areas for, uh, for collaboration there. More, more sets of eyes, for example, on equipment. Risk assessment of the safety people, as we pointed out early with the, uh, with the posters and the checklist and so on. The idea of safety as a system, they have, a different, uh, have different ways of thinking than we in FM, especially in O&M. And those two work well together in risk assessment. FCI, facility, FCA, excuse me, that's uh, facility, condition, facility condition assessment. Um, again, the different sets of eyes and the relative expense, capital and operating expense that management might encounter in taking care of systems. Who better to, to know what might be done with a fire protection system, for example, fire detection and, and protection system with uh, um, with uh, with policies about floor coatings, anti-slip floor coatings, uh, with lighting for safety and security. Uh, they're certainly welcome there, and a collaboration would be helpful. Maintaining aging facilities. We've talked quite about quite a bit about those tonight, and indeed, uh, they tend to pose both the larger hazards, although there certainly are some new ones with that contribute, um, but. Maintaining aging facilities and equipment are areas where uh, familiarity with one another, familiarity with one another's perspective, calling up and saying, hey, could you have a look at this? Uh, give the organization benefit, potentially. Maintenance, of course, planned and unplanned. And finally, communication, of course. So we're interested in, in knowing initiatives that you might take or, or possibilities for development in any of these where you might be interested in teaming up with some members in the uh, OMHS Action Committee, the SAG. Uh, a few resources, and I these are few because they they struck me as 
as valuable and not very widely known. First of all, the OSHA program that I spoke of, the Safe State program, uh, is an option on the OSHA homepage. And so you can go and read a bit about it. You have one in your state. It's probably university-based. And a Pearl River Glass of company as small as about 25 people did very well with this. It helped them out a lot. And in, during participation and after, they're not inspected by uh, the other OSHA, by regulatory OSHA. So it's really uh, it's quite a carrot and stick approach, and there's a lot of professional knowledge. I only have experience with Alabama and Mississippi, but I'll bet the rest of them are, are pretty good. And perhaps for you from other nations, uh, you probably have something comparable. A second one one that surprised me because I'm an adherent to risk management uh, from a mathematics point of view, from an FM point of view, and I have a vocabulary. I don't have the insurance industry vocabulary. And perhaps you, your, when your underwriter comes to call and makes inspections of your facilities, when you talk with uh, people in, in insurance, they seem to use a slightly different speech. This glossary from the RM, R, excuse me, IRMI is online, free, and fill out a few forms, and really enlightening to me. Now I know what the inspector is talking about. I know sort of anyway, but I can now talk the talk and walk the walk much better. And finally, my own contact, David Reynolds FM at PO-Box.com. P.O. Box is uh, a, a forwarder, so I'll have that address forever. So thank you very much for uh, for participating tonight. I. Nobody came in to drag me out, so I, I guess I didn't go too fast. And so let's do a little discussion, if you'd like. Um, we uh, we have all the time in the world, like that fellow repairing the automobile there on the left, showing good practice. Any questions? Uh, Joshua, do you have anything coming up in the... Uh... Um, I do not currently have any questions in the Q&A box. Um, we'll give it just a moment to see if anyone has anything. Okay. Let me see, uh, things we could talk about, how to be absolutely sure that you don't have harmful <laughs> incidents in your place of work. Um, how many have had an incident in the last year? You do a hand raise if you'd like, just curious. Uh, whoops, I can't see that. Uh, and I'll say that I have had one. Can you see the hands? Uh, Joshua? Yeah, no, yeah, no one has them raised. No one. Well, you, well, you, you folks have done well. You're perhaps a, a luckier lot than I. <laughs> but uh, any anything above zero is too many. Good. Well, Joshua, back to you. Okay, great. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Yes, that's me. Uh, yes, yes. Hold on. I'm coming at you. <laughs> I do want to thank everyone for attending I today. Do it. Yeah. We and um, we have the next installment on the FMCC's virtual conference will be Allison Heller Ono for Ask the Experts Consultants Chat Office Ergonomics Facility Planning with Ergonomics for LEAD. And that should look like it would be a great session. And then we have other sessions continuing on through the for North America with the evening for other regions during their daytime. And we'll be going through Thursday. Next slide. Oops, yes, next slide. And <laughs> SMC Sorry, I... does have an app. It is available in the iTunes Store or through Google Play. Next slide. Mm -hmm. And the FMCC STAG group is always looking for volunteers. So if you'd like to volunteer, please feel free and contact Ricardo. His email well, is on the screen. Or contact me. Well, we'll uh, we're happy. They right. check in, but they don't check out. Right, or contact David. He'd be happy to hear from you. Next slide. And as always, the FMCC does like to let everyone be aware of the other councils and communities that are out there within the IFMA umbrella that can serve as resources for these various topics. Next slide. And last but not least, I want to thank David for a great and interesting presentation. And I want to thank everyone for attending today. You have a great rest of your day. Thanks, y'all.